Welcome back to Day Talk, fellow talkers. And on this very episode, we're gonna talk about a secret Russian poison program. And with us, as always, to talk about it is Miss Alexandra from Strike the Truth. Hi, thanks for having me back and looking forward to talk about some secret Russian poisonings, which is one of my specialities on my blog anyway. Yes, you have written many, many articles about these weird deaths and uh, Litvinenko is one of them, right? Yes, there has been quite many. I mean, Litvinenko, Skripal, Navalny in the past year, they're the famous ones. Yeah, it looks like uh, the preferred weapon of the Russian spies is poison for some reason. Yeah, and actually the interesting thing is that, at least in modern times, these poisons are illegal. And these programs are also illegal, but they are still going on. Yes, they are indeed. And as we know already during the Soviet times, comrade Stalin ruled the land with an iron boot. The Soviet Union went through the Great Purge in 1930s. Some 1.2 million people were killed or sent in the gulags and prison camps back in Siberia. But the atrocities started already in the early 1920s. And I believe our story of these poison facilities, factories or secret programs starts similar time. Yeah, that's right. So to jump right into it, in 1921, they set up a secret laboratory that was under Professor Ignaty Kasakov. And a few years later, um, it was taken over by uh, Jenrik Yakoda, who became the head of the NKVD in 1934. Yeah, that's right. The Yakoda actually run the NKVD and the NKVD took a huge part in these Soviet purges, right? Yeah, actually he was one of the main players and this was mainly because the NKVD was kind of a German Gestapo. You know, it was a task force that was created to basically watch over the populace and make sure that they were doing everything that the Soviet system wanted them to do. In uh, February 1939, uh, uh, Mr. Grigory Marinovsky took over this lab. And at that point, it was called Laboratory Number One. And Marinovsky will remind you of another German similarity, and that is Dr. Mengele. Oh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, the angel of death. Yes. So Mr. Grigory Marinovsky is basically the angel of death of the Soviet Union. And this is because he invented many substances that we can use even today to kill people. He was a biochemist and poisons developer that was known to have tested his substances on gulag prisoners. Yeah, uh, sounds sure like Dr. Mengele. Mengele did these experiments uh, while he was the head doctor of Auschwitz concentration camp situated in eastern Prussia, which is known as Poland before the war and after the war. Uh, Of course, now I have to remind all the viewers that Even the Japanese army in the Pacific area in uh, China, I believe, had these kinds of programs that they used these Chinese prisoners of war to conduct most inhuman experiments. Yeah, and you're right about the Japanese. And actually, it's very unknown that they did these things. I first heard about them when I was in Singapore on holiday. And at Santosa Fortress, they have a whole museum about this, which is quite interesting because, you know, in Australia, we're so close to Japan and we learn everything about Asian history, but nobody talks about how brutal the Japanese were. All you hear about is Germany. 
Yeah, yeah. And the Japan was also an Axis state and on the same side than Germany. But I believe that's a, a quick side note here is something to do with the America's uh, point of view, how they wanted the Japanese or Japanese people and Japan to be treated. When these trials happened after the war in Germany and the high uh, Yahtzee officials were hanged and executed. The same time in Japan, they got rid of these trials quickly and started to rebuild the country and wrote the constitution there to be more uh, Western. And at the same time, they kind of buried these war crimes and atrocities that were at least on the same level with the Germans and with the Soviet Union during that time. Yeah, and you know, these days Japan is one of the well, well-loved countries of the West. So I guess it worked, the cleansing campaign. Um, back to our lab story. Uh, Marianovsky was working to create the perfect poison, something that you couldn't see it in autopsies, something that was odorless, tasteless, and virtually impossible to detect. While he was doing these experiments, um, he came up with some commonly known substances that we're probably still using today. And these will be familiar to you. Uh, things like mustard gas, curare, ricin, digitoxin, cyanide, and many, many more. Some countries, I believe, still have those in a combat use, like the Iraq used them against Iran in 1980s, and the mustard gas, I believe, and against the Kurds after the first Gulf War in 1990s. And I believe also in Syria, back in 2010s, I don't remember the exact year, some of the combat gases were used against the insurgents by the Syrian government. These are highly illegal according to the international law and the law of warfare. So I don't think the United States or Russia would openly use them in any war zone. Well, you would expect that as with many of these substances. Um, but the thing is that what you'll find in the story with Russia, especially, I don't know about other countries, I would presume they work the same way. Um, even though these sub substances are illegal to use now, they're still implemented. But we mentioned earlier, curare is one of the poisons that was investigated in this program. Curare is a poison found in a plant from the Amazon that is used by the Amazonian tribes as a way to paralyze people. And Stalin, once he found out, got very interested and realized the power of poisons. So he created this program to try to find the perfect poison that was tasteless, odorless, and virtually undetectable. And this was the goal of Marianovsky he got very close to inventing the perfect poison. And this is known as, now I'm going to butcher the name, uh, cabralamine choline chloride, or C2 or K2 for short. Yeah, I, I think we use that shorter, shorter name, at least if I'm going to mention it, I use that C or K2. Well, it's definitely more used than the actual name. <laughs> and he actually tested this substances on, man on many prisoners of different builds, ages, healths. And the testimonies from various witnesses say that uh, the way this poison would affect people is that they would become very quiet and still. They would become weak. The, the height would appear smaller, like they would shrivel up. 
and then they would die within 15 minutes of administering this poison. That sounds horrible. Yeah, it definitely was. The thing is that this lab wasn't only responsible to create these poisons and substances, um, it was also tasked with exterminating various people that the Soviet Union deemed that they should die. So they basically cut two birds with a one stone here. You're right there that it was a one-stop shop for testing poisons on people and also killing them at the same time. Because it's a well-known fact that Marianovsky wouldn't approve any poisons to be used unless they were experimented on humans. I guess the guy had high standards of quality. He wanted to see that the stuff actually works on the subjects that he's going to be used against. And often those subjects were political prisoners or people that Stalin thought were against his ideals. Sounds like Soviet Union to me. So we mentioned that it was known as Lab 1. Then it was known as Lab 12, Lab X. And the most common name that is still used t today is Camera or the cell in English. Which is quite funny because Camera in Romanian means room. If there's any Russian-speaking folks who are watching this episode, please translate this word to English under the comment section here. They say that this lab was stopped when the Soviet Union collapsed, but then it was reportedly reactivated in the 1990s. They formed the SVR, and then they took over the operations of these poisons labs, and they call them research facilities. Yeah, well, in a manner of speaking, they were doing research there, right? Yeah, and to this day, they're still running these programs, like we said, and they're still called research facilities. Uh, by the way, this SVR, for people who don't know, is a foreign intelligence service. That's interesting, because they have there the SVR, the GRU, the FSB, they all seem to do the similar things. Isn't the GRU a military intelligence organization? It is. Um, the GRU is suspected to have poisoned Navalny. And to be honest, if you look at the people that are poisoned by Russia, and there's a very long list, the term GRU officers is pretty much present in all of them. So I think that's the executive branch of things, and I don't mean leaders. I think you're right in that. And now to get to a list of alleged and known victims by this program. Right. Like I said, there's a very long list, and we mentioned some of them. Um, but there are some less known ones. Let me guess they are journalists, businessmen who don't... Uh, work for the Russian government anymore, and uh, former uh, intelligence agents or something like that, or civil activists. Yes, to all of the above. But the, the interesting thing is how they died. I'll just kind of summarize how they died. Yeah. Uh, one of them died from a fast and mysterious disease shortly before he was supposed to uh, testify to the FBI. Another one died after she fell violently ill and lost consciousness from drinking tea. Then more people also fell into comas, mysterious illnesses, had heart attacks. Of course, we know Navalny was very ill and was throwing up all over the place. And then he went in a coma. Hey, I must ask now, what about the... This former president of Ukraine, was it like uh, Yukashenko? I think he was poisoned somehow. Well, Yushchenko, yes. He is actually one of the victims. And he was poisoned with something called TCDD dioxin. He survived, but his kind of face and body is severely scarred. Now we know that the Ukraine is in a certain uh, state of war 
there are separatists operating in the eastern Ukraine and, and the Crimea is taken over by the Russian Federation and the situation is pretty unclear since 2014. And this uh, poisoning of Yushchenko happened during some presidential campaign before 2010. So in those parts of the world, these kinds of operations have been run quite a long time. Yeah, this actually happened in 2004. Mm. And um, another interesting person is Vladimir Vladimirovich Karamuza, who is actually one of Navalny's closest aides. Um, he's an opposition politician that is still in Russia. And Karamuza is a very well-known critic of Putin to mm. this day. He was actually poisoned twice, once in May 2015, after he was talking about the assassination of Boris, Boris Nemtsov, whose family suspect that he was also poisoned. So he was ill and in a coma. And then in 2017, again, he was hospitalized because of alleged poisoning. Right. And now it's 2021 and he's still doing the same thing. So maybe in the next few years, we'll hear he's been poisoned again. Yeah, uh, definitely looks like these kinds of programs are still very much active. I'm not sure if this camera or lap one or lap 12, as it was called, the cell exists. And I don't think it even have has to exist as a facility anymore. But if I would have to put my money on something, they have some program where all of this stuff is coming from. Well, when Litvinenko was poisoned, they could trace the polonium back to a facility in Russia mm. where the atomic waste is supposed to be disposed. So I guess instead of disposing it, they use it to experiment on how to create radioactive poisons. Yeah, and on that note, we have to ask you, viewers, what do you think? Does the camera or lap 1, lap 12 or lap X still exist? Or are these poisons coming from a predecessor of these programs? Write your thoughts under the comments. Also, leave us a like and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any of our crazy weekly episodes. And as always... See you next week. Bye.